Discovery Houston, recommend uh, vector transfer to the BFS. Discovery 4 computers now have primary control of critical vehicle functions. Glispugin, sitting in front of the computer, is trying to type. He places both hands above the keyboard. He gives up, exhausted, and his hands drop into his lap. After resting for a time, he raises his hands again, only to drop them as before. My definition of electronic literature is, I want to say stories, because I always associate stories with literature. And electronic means that there has been either some intervention in the authoring process, which involves digital technology, or in the delivery process, which has digital technology. I try to recall winter as if it were yesterday, she says, but I do not signify one way or another. By five, the sun sets and the afternoon melt freezes again across the blacktop into crystal octopi and palms of ice. Rivers and continents beset by fear and we walk out to the car, the snow moaning beneath our boots and the oaks exploding in series along the fence line on the horizon, the shrapnel settling like relics, the echoing thundering off far ice. This was the essence of wood, these fragments say, and this darkness is air. Poetry, she says, without emotion, one way or another. I wrote this in Michigan. I actually can remember the sound of on freezing days. They may, may not have been oaks exploding, but the trees kind of popping off along the ridge. And I remember also having walked to my office and seen the afternoon melt freezing across the blacktop like crystal octopi. I'm having an incredible deja vu looking at the screen. My definition of electronic literature would be any form of writing that is dynamic, meaning it can be collaborated on or edited or changed at will. A check tablecloth lay in an isolated clearing. A bottle of red wine, two glasses of cheese and bread. Walking the sound of water, water. weight capped the sound of water, or a bottle Wait, of Cabernet Sauvignon, Sauvignon set on a wooden tablecloth, Sauvignon set on a wooden tablecloth, cold Four. water, crystal goblets, Four. unexpectedly crystal goblets. midnight, unexpectedly at midnight, purple lupine Four. on the hillside, beside the Dempsey dumpster in town, walking down to the water, where the homeless gather, a flower, a flower dress. dress Unexpected woodland events. Wait, capped spring water in winter. A bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon set on a linen tablecloth. Cold, Cold water. water. A flower, flower dress. The smell of hops and honey. The, the smell of green in grass. The outflow of stone by the river. The a smell of front green door. grass. Under the eaves of the by the river. The, the cabin where we were working. The sound of water. White capped mountains. Purple lupine on the hillside, making love. Electronic literature is forms of literature that make use of the uh, computer or the network context uh, to achieve uh, effects that wouldn't be possible in print. My birth takes place more than once in the plea of a bygone monster from a muddy hole by corpse light under the needle and under the pen. Or it took place not at all. But if I hope to tell a good story, I must leapfrog out of the muddle of my several births to the day I parted for the last time with the author of my being and set out to write my own destiny. So it might start with smell, when that's possible in the future. At the present, it starts with image very dominantly and proceeds through text to sound in kind of a, a hierarchy, which I very much dislike. But I think the opportunities within that for interaction between those different senses and different means of generating stuff are just fantastic, particularly when we bring similar algorithms to bear on all of them. And we see their interactions both at the code, the sonic, the visual, and the meaning level. Electronic literature is the exploration of concepts beyond the ordinary using electronic means. And in traditional vision-based media, you have moving pictures, you have 
more traditional genres such as you know printed text where things don't move around but electronic literature involves exploring how we take concepts how we perceive the world and ourselves and trying to portray that using computation using the specific processes that are unique to computers there are two main literary parents for me for the fiction and one of them is Thomas Pynchon mm -hmm. and um, Gravity's Rainbow which is a novel which contains within it music hall numbers, popular songs, equation. Uh, there are there are no there are no visible artworks, but there is a tremendous reference to the language of, of art and film and music and theater. And that was a that was a mental model for me that the novel did not have to proceed in a linear fashion using only narrative. Electronic literature for me is literature that takes advantage of the capacity of new media to um, alter the state of writing. It's, it's literature that engages its digitality. I remember sitting in my office when, when Jeff finished the Mary Collins on Thinking Time. I said, oh my God, this used to be bothered to read this thing. Prepared, sugar is not a quest volume. In the for glass the sake, door, these certain methods very Reach clean if there is no seen pleasure. variety, very, very clean small if there bridge, is no pleasure, overly moist prepared, sugar is not a volume, not having examined the room, grabbing at these rags, kindness, related to the vulture, and shape, however, in varying sides and the door, for the sake, for the sake, journey, use, last, they open, are double, for the sake, and rapid exploration required, most commonly classes, while the body, by the crowd, justified by appeal, Electronic literature is two words that go together, resonate together. Uh, I, I suppose I would say it is can be considered practice involving text that resonates with considerations of media, resonates with uh, problems of media or platforms of media, taking advantage of platforms of media, as Amrit said, or for me, resonating with conceptual issues involving mediation and digitization of information communication. So the first screen you see is this big image made in Mac Paint, if anyone knows what that is. It's just like a splash page, an image of the patchwork girl herself. Click through it to what is essentially a title page, Patchwork Girl or a Modern Monster by Mary slash Shelley and herself. And from here, you have links to five different sections of the text. The graveyard, the journal, the quilt, the story, and something called broken accents. I think electronic literature is literature which requires a device to be read. And the device has to be electronic. And I work with artist books. Um, I was influenced by the works that I saw in camera works um, by um, works in San Jose, which is um, and by the art space of San Jose State that Stephen Muir, Moore curated. So I was in a field that was halfway between visual arts and halfway between writing. And of course, performance art also that I was associated with, and the artist's books. So those were uh, interests that I continued with. Electronic literature is machine-enabled stories, poems, images uh, that are not available only as traditional print or uh, sculptural uh, events. They're mediated by machines, and they don't exist in a, a format that the other arts have traditionally taken. Boxes, raising the dirt, only several colors, tall the one cluster away, variety each a method, package of seeds, Mysteries. the several not Stone in rows. Stone especially smooth, location chip it down, magnified the bottom, darting in the habitual shadow, steam bending. We're all moving toward storytelling in digital space. And some of the most interesting experiments that are happening are in um, electronic literature. You're coming out of a, a Dadaist tradition uh, of saying 
there is there's something beyond this, and and I'm I'm going to rearrange this stuff and and find other layers beyond the visible, or make other layers. I think electronic literature is digital born literature that would not exist otherwise than by mediation through a computer. Electronic literature is the exploration of how we can tell stories with the augmentation uh, of technology. So what technology makes possible in our storytelling palette. And particularly thinking about kind of the networked and connective tissues of literature and storytelling and the ways that we realize those through the technologies we already use all the time, particularly on the web. The lack of clear signal is an attempt to vex you and rather an invitation to read either inquisitively or playfully and, playfully and also object if and where it interests you or invite you. Electronic literature can be a number of things. It, it's interactive. It has to do with words and images. I go in and out of what to call myself. I still say different things. But within the community, I create electronic literature, yeah. which, which I would call poetic narrative. So I'm a poet who works with narrative. I think the day that comes that we don't actually distinguish it as electronic literature is the day that, that uh, we finally, uh, well, I, will be the day that, well, we don't have to ask questions like that again. Ah, an otherworldly glass of beer up here. Ah, the black but wouldn't you like an otherworldly ah, glass of beer? But wouldn't you like an otherworldly glass of beer? Up here bushes, just beside the trail as you crest the hill amber-colored beer in a tall crystal glass, quite, quite fallen on Adam's side. sides. The smell of hops and honey, a golden icebox. Ah, but wouldn't you like an otherworldly glass of beer? The sound of water, white-capped mountains, amber-colored the sound beer in a tall water. crystal white glass, white-capped mountains, cold water, amber-colored Beer White in a tall running down the sides. Cold water Walking down to the water, the smell of hops and honey. The daily in and out flow of a billion bites. The daily the smell in and out green flow grass. of a billion bites. The world stone the smell by the river of green grass. Go red hunt to it is stones by the river of Word, go red hunt to image, sound, moving image, amber color touch, beer in a tall crystal bits. glass. Mind, body, heart. To be linked to the chain of existence and events, yes, but bound by it, no. I forge my own links. I'm building my own monstrous chain. And as time goes on, perhaps it will begin to resemble, rather, a web. Primarily artistic work that has a strong emphasis in the literary, but cannot be divorced from its medium, which is digital, and so uh, you can't print it. It's not like an ebook. One of the challenges I had set for me for this text was to try to write a novel that no 20th century writer could write. And the only way to do that is obviously to try to push the text itself beyond what it's possible to, possible to do. So including projective at things like the oracle, including a borrower that literally takes the text and reconfigures it in ways that cannot be predicted. And that, I think, is you know, what Burroughs is getting at. It's that um, the, the, the text itself can be exploded, and that when you take those pieces and reassemble them, something new can come out that you did not even put there, that you did not know was there. Um, and that is what makes it, a, a, that pushes it beyond what you can, you as a writer can possibly do. I guess I would say that electronic literature is reading, um, and it could be, it could be symbols, it could be icons, um, through some sort of electronic means. It could be digital, it could be analog electricity, and so something I would say interactive would be maybe a, a key word, but not necessarily. Um, kinetic, perhaps, a couple of things, but I feel like it's such a broad thing, it's hard to just define. I think you you just got to be, be open 
to what's out there. Hypertext, to put it clearly, is a mapping of a text onto a four-dimensional space. Normal grammars, then, do not apply and become branching structures anew. Fragments, branches, links. The word is glowing and on a screen. It is electronic and cannot be touched. It has been copied over thousands of times and reverberates through virtual space. The text coils in on itself. It is a topographic map of the air currents in the upper atmosphere, those sudden winds that change direction, inexplicable. The reader becomes a sort of satellite taking photographs of a huge and varied terrain. The reader can see the whole world or zoom in to see a particular ant on the banks of the Seine. The ant has six legs. The reader is staring at a video screen. How then to turn the page? To me, electronic literature is any kind of uh, literary practice that does not depend on the printed page, but may include the printed page. Remember, I have to remember, you have to remember, that um, I wrote this entire text in the machine, and so I was always its first reader, and I was discovering the ways it had changed in there. There was never a flow chart, there was never any, any, any set of text to say, say the way through, so I was pursuing kinds of texture too. There are a lot of electronic literature classes, but how many are actually teaching students the range of what they can do in the field? How many new student writers are we producing? We are producing some, but not enough. It was one of my central theses in Patchwork Girl that there is no central thesis, <laughs> that there is no center, that there is no self, there is only a temporary and contingent coming, contingent coming together of influences and borrowed pieces that could as easily have come together in another form mm -hmm. and will come together in another form that the desire to make oneself coherent and permanent is a doomed one, but not only doomed, also an unhealthy one, that part of our job is to learn to let go <laughs> of ourselves. And literature is one of the ways we learn to let go of ourselves, let learn to release ourselves into the stream of other people's thoughts and visions and to enjoy that alienation from our own monotonous dream of consciousness. And I think literature is this, the use of language to sort of disrupt the, its in, instrumental applications, right? So um, the question of electronic literature then is how, do, how are people working in the uh, digital vernacular or the in emerging sort of media landscape to um, estrange people from the, the conventional codes that, that try to organize human behavior and to create an occasion for something uh, otherwise. We look now at how simple it is to create immersive, full-res images. And we just did not have that technology. So I am, I am very happy with the narrative premise, and I'm very happy with the way I executed, given the constraints, but I, I would really wish I could fix some of those pictures. Electronic literature is anything that you can't do in a linear print, and electronic is the wrong word here. It's anything that stretches text beyond what we have been doing. So I'm actually not too happy about the electronic, digital, analog idea. What I want to say is that we are stretching text, and I'd like to go back to the traditional meaning of hypertext, which was overactive text. Complex, more material, spiral, drinking, genetic, memory content, world, dancing ground, the masses against control, complex, more material, the spiral, a life faster, meet, split, or unite. For me, electronic literature is anything that's generated in new media that involves reading and writing. And that reading and writing can be connected to any um, other medium because of the electronic context.
closure is, a, as in any picture, a suspect quality, although here it's made manifest. I wasn't aware exactly how inflammatory that was. I've been burned by that over the years, and people say, well, if I'm, I remember somebody writing in, in the New York Times saying that this was an MO work because it didn't have a beginning, middle, and end, and it, that literary work should have a beginning, middle, and end, and that closure was what made something moral. When the story no longer progresses, or when it cycles, or when you're tired of the path, the experience of reading it ends. Even so, there are likely to be more opportunities than you think there are at first. A word which doesn't yield the first time you read a section may take you elsewhere if you choose it when you encounter the section again. And sometimes what seems a leap, like memory, heads off in another direction. There is no simple way to say this. Probably the most well-known sentence in the entire work, except maybe the first sentence, is there is no simple way to say this. My response to what is electronic literature is, if you can read it, see it, hear it, play it, and sing it, it's probably electronic literature. Midnight and at who devotes only and at who devotes only the system under the login of a long departed guest whose password still resided in my memory. Midnight the and at who devotes only at that hour. She I too entered the system me. under the login. Who of are you, guess who? Guess. Scroll Who's across my screen to read me by a chat request. Electronic literature is literature that's made on the computer and intended to be read on the computer. Digital work uh, that addresses questions of uh, reading and writing. And I believe that electronic literature is literature that uses the internet or computers or mobile phones or such technology to function. My definition of electronic literature would be uh, multimodal digital production meant to be read on a screen, a computer screen. As far as electronic literature goes, whoa, that's a toughie. I, I think it, it's literature that can't be presented in a static way, such as on a printed page. So there's something about the digital that is intrinsic to the, the work of art. My definition of electronic literature um, is digital narrative is the first term that comes to mind because that's how I entered into the group. But the longer I have been here, I have found it means poetics, it means coding, it means all sorts of ways of manipulating language using digital technology and not always to tell a story. <laughs> well, for me, um, electronic literature is a strange hybrid that combines uh, a literary sensitivity with uh, all the potential that digital technology can provide to the artist. Literature, whether consumed or created on some type of electronic medium, which would mean something or anything that needs electricity, requires electricity. It's organic, like the branches of a tree. Yeah, it's an electric toaster in that tree that serves up pop-up poetry. I would define electronic literature as any text that can only exist on a computer. Electronic literature feels to me like something that it has been deliberately left undefined and perhaps undefinable. I think that it's a concept in transition uh, that may actually never find a definition and fade from our vocabulary before anything gets codified, settles in. They think electronic literature is anything that is branching and interactive. Works that make use of uh, the capabilities of the digital context uh, and the digital properties to create pieces of work, I don't know, some kind of, that kind of stuff. <laughs> I consider electronic literature to be literary work, work with interesting literary aspects that takes advantage of the capabilities of the computer, whether it's networking, multimedia, computation, interactivity, uh, and it uh, is extending what the literary means using computation and computers and their capabilities. When I think about what is electronic literature, 
it gets kind of tied up with other terms that we have used to define this field. We call this hypertext, digital literature, new media literature, electronic literature, all those four terms have been used to define the field or, or name the field that we are in. Hypertext was one of the earliest names and it extends beyond um, the, the electronic screen. It, uh, if you go back to Ted Nelson's definition of that, it's a conceptual way of how do you provide more text to than what is, what is traditionally available or possible in a printed book. Um, then when we got to computers, the, it was a natural medium for creating those hypertext types of experiments. Um, that then morphed into digital oh, literature right. and to, uh, into elect, um, digital me literature, new media literature. Um, I hate the term new media literature because it arrogantly assumes that what we are working in will always be the newest thing. Um, just like new criticism, after a time that terms become dated. Um, but digital literature and now electronic literature. Um, the um, electronic literature is probably the broadest term for what we're working with, but it, we're still usually talking about something that's created for the computer. And, um, but I think it should be still tied to some of those early discussions that we were having with hypertext. Some early themes such as multilinearity, uh, questions of authority, questions of agency, questions of interactivity, questions of play, that those would still be part of the questions of what we're talking about when we're talking about electronic literature. So it isn't just does it use electricity. It has to be to some degree in what way does it tie in with where can what can we do in this medium to make the literature more interactive, more playful. What I think for me of electronic literature is finding ways that people communicate in real life about, about their real lives and then fictionalizing them, how, however they're doing that. And that kind of changes with every new technology. But there's sort of a moment where people are enacting their, themselves through some new form of writing. And then I love getting in there and, and creating fake you know imaginary characters and doing ima having impossible things happen in that in that format for me digital literature is the relationship between the literary dimension and the medium specificity dimension the digital uh, dimension and the way we can think you know in a specific way A culture with one work upon another. The Pathlines project is a preservation project that aims to make electronic literature available for generations beyond us. This project is very important because if you think about it, early digital literature represents a cultural moment and a historical change in the way we think about literature. In Pathfinders, we used a concept called traversal, a way of capturing author and user interactions on the work's original platform. I wanted the reader to feel that there were distinctly different human stories. This is fundamentally embodied. Somebody told me it was their bedtime story every day, and uh, it was a lot of fun to do, and I also found telling the story that way appealed to the social media nature of, of the audience. We think this method of preservation in conjunction with things like migration and emulation will keep crucial works alive so that future readers can better understand them. Without a doubt, we have the potential to transform the field of digital media preservation. This multimedia book is just the beginning. Welcome to the second of seven live stream traversal broadcasts from the Electronic Literature Lab at Washington State University, Vancouver. 
I'm Dina Grigard, the director of the lab, and all, I'm also the professor of the Creative Media and Digital Culture Program here at the university. Today you will hear pioneering ELIT hypertext artist and philosopher David Kolb perform his work from 1994, the hypertext essay, Socrates and the Lambrith. This event is part of the Born Digital Preservation Series celebrating the electronic literature organization's move from MIT to WSUV. It is sponsored by WSUV, also by the WSU's Lewis E. and Stella G. Distinguished Professorship, and of course the Electronic Literature Organization. In the online audience today, we have many uh, folks involved in the CMGC program. Thank you, Amanda Walcott, for being here. Nathaniel, thank you for being here, and others. I think Federico from Italy. Um, I saw Mike Cosgrave from um, Cork. I believe Stuart Malthrop is coming in from Milwaukee. And I want to thank the folks in the room itself, whom you can see in the, from, the live, from the live audience, the folks here from the CMGC program, students and faculty. You're probably wondering what is meant by a traversal. And this is a process that was developed for the Pathfinders project by Stuart Malthrop and me. It's defined as an audio video recall, recording of a demonstration performed on a historically appropriate platform by an author or readers of a work. The Pathfinders methodology was created for preserving interactive and media rich works that cannot be captured in print or even migrated or emulated due to copyright issues. Along with the traversal, the Pathfinders methodology includes a lot of other things, including the material artifact itself, which I'm holding in my hand, um, pictures of uh, the uh, diskettes and CDs, um, essays, sound files, um, bios of the authors, and, and things like that. And we're, we collect this material and put it into a multimedia book as a way of documenting this work for long-term long -term preservation. Today, we're live streaming this traversal as well as capturing it on social media. And this social media is generated by um, the students in the room that are working, the, the researchers, and as well as you online who are posting on Facebook and Twitter. All of this media will be combined in that, in that uh, book that I mentioned earlier and put on the Pathfinders website as well. Um, assisting today, I'd like to also give um, um, a lot of thank yous to Nicholas Schiller, who's my associate director of the lab, Greg Philbrook, who's the instructional and technology support person. He's the one handling all the background work and he's holding the paper for me that I'm reading right now um, in his very hands. Um, we have four research assistants in this lab. Vanessa Rhodes is the ELIT e research associate. Uh, Veronica Whitney is the L catalog specialist. Mariah Gwynn is our games research assistant. And Katie Bowen is our document specialist. We are fortunate to have with us also today the author of this hypertext. David Kolb received his PhD in philosophy from Yale University and he taught for many years at the University of Chicago and then he moved to Bates College. After he retired, he moved to Eugene, Oregon, which is great for us, and he is now the Charles A. Dana Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at Bates. The link to this live stream will be archived at the L <coughs> website, which we will post on Facebook and Twitter for you, so pay attention if you want to follow along. Our Twitter channel and, and our Twitter handle and our Facebook channel hashtag are both ELIT Pathfinders. David will perform for about 30 minutes or so and will follow up this performance with a question and answer. You can post your questions to the live chat, which I will be monitoring during this time that he's um, talking and after, and we'll get those questions to David and let him answer that. We should be finished around 1.30ish um, today, probably. So I, with no further ado, I'd love to welcome David Kolb to his traversal. Thank you, Dean. I wrote this piece because I was interested in what was happening with hypertext to break up traditional unities. And I wondered what effect that would have on the traditional unities in philosophy. You can see on the screen here that the piece consists of five files, the large one, Socrates and the Labyrinth, and four example files which show different ways in which you could use hypertext to illuminate philosophy. When you click on the major file, you uh, find yourself on this screen, which has a little introduction, the text, and some bibliography. I'm going to go straight 
to the text part, which has these five portions, and you'll notice that each of those has sub-portions. In this program, Story Space, you have lexias or nodes connected by links of various kinds. And I'm going to start with this link. Ted Nelson, the inventor of the term hypertext, said, by hypertext I mean non-sequential writing. Familiar text is a linear sequence of parts. The parts can be of various sizes, sentences, paragraphs, chapters, and so on. It's true that books are not perfectly linear. They have footnotes, cross-references, indices. Yet although the parts of the text may refer to one another non-sequentially, and you may read in a non-sequential way, the text comes to us in a preferred order, and authors spend a lot of time trying to create a clear, convincing sequence of that order. A hypertext, by contrast, is a web of pieces of text. The individual units may be sentence length or chapter length or whatever, but the, what is crucial is that they do not relate to one another in any one single unique sequence. The web is like a map or a landscape. Many different routes emerge. The author can't control which links the reader will follow, and in some systems, the reader can create new links, so it gets more complicated. The most common usage of hypertext, and what it was originally invented for, was information retrieval. If hypertext has an essence, it's that multiple links lead from one piece of text to another. It was originally conceived in the 30s by Vannevar Bush as a non-sequential, non-hierarchical way of organizing and linking scientific and engineering knowledge. And it's used for that. We're all familiar with web hypertext, which gives you a manual for the piece of software or your washing machine or something like that. And it's beginning to show up in compendia of various kinds. But what makes hypertext different from linear text? Abstractly speaking, in hypertext, the discrete units of text within multiple chain links compose a differently connected space, allowing various paths. Now, if you look down at the bottom of this paragraph, the hard question is not what abstract patterns of connection they have, but what uses they will find, what forms of life they will enable. A printed page can be part of many widely differing activities. I mean, think about it. You can use paper to make a laundry list, to write a love letter, to write a novel, to tabulate things. What are we going to use hypertext for? Lin linear text, web text. We don't know. We're creating new forms of writing and new forms of life. Well, my particular interest was in knowing how that would relate to philosophy. When I got into this, I read Robert Coover's article in 1992, where he argued that hypertext was a one way to undermine or deconstruct the narrative line. And I thought to myself, hmm, I wonder whether you could undermine or deconstruct the argumentative line. And philosophy depends upon lines, arguments, if you think that philosophy is about arguments. So one of my problems was to decide what, what do we mean by philosophy's task, and is it simply the production of arguments? Do hypertext webs provide new possibilities for writing that's less linear and still does philosophical work? One standard view of the relation of philosophy and argument would be that philosophy is constituted by the presence of a line. I want to qualify that conclusion. For even if the line is required, it may not be the single controlling element in philosophy. Not all paths follow the line. If we can dechronologize narrative, what, if anything, can we do with philosophy and argument? We might think about it this way. Philosophy's line, I mean, think about not just your classic big philosophy works, but a, a very tight professional article. The line finds itself surrounded by supplements, which it both desires and rejects. 
marginalia, parallel columns, material in parentheses, footnotes, social comments, reflections on its method, ironic juxtaposition, and so on. And then I talk uh, about different kinds of them. The line tends to become encrusted with its precondition. We might think best about hypertext philosophy, not as images of great intellect systems, but through Derrida's deconstruction, an errant descendant of Hegel's dialectic, one that glories in incomplete holes, interrupted necessity, and lacks and emphasizes the lack of totality and closure in any form. George Landau, one of the early pioneers, has shown many parallels between contemporary literary theory and hypertext technology. He's particularly concerned with the overall effect of hypertext as a medium. He argues it will question the unity of the text, the roles of the reader and the author, and the power relations of education and access to information. Skipping the quote here. While I find Lando's general direction convincing, I'm not sure that his arguments are quite conclusive. Now, this is going to take some explanation and it goes through many different lexia in this text. But the point I'm going to try to make is that hypertext can do deconstructive things, but there's some things it can't do. Now, let me pull back for a moment. There's a good long portion of this hypertext which concerns how to represent arguments in hypertext. And that's more technical stuff that has to do with different forms of analyzing and setting out argumentative lines. So that's all there. You can explore that if you read the text. What I'm concerned with here is what you do beyond that. What should hypertext do beyond being a tool to find a new way to structure somebody's argument? How can it surround the argument with new kinds of text? How can it create new gestures? How can it create new ways of doing philosophy. But returning to the deconstructive question, in some ways, Lando says, look, we cut up the text and we put the author in a different position because he's not controlling the reader's experience. In some ways, hypertext, I say, does not question the unity of the text deeply enough. The very endlessness of possible links means that none of them needs question the integrity of the individual lexia, the individual node, in the way that deconstructive operations conducted on site can do. Links lack the contingent fecundity of immediate juxtaposition and the self-referentiality of complexly clever textual terms. Hypertext links can change Alexia's relations and its role within a context, but they cannot easily make it reflect on or exceed its own unity. So the issue here is hypertext can do certain deconstructive things, but not all of them. Well, then what can it do? What does it bring to philosophy with it? Well, one of the things I'm arguing in this talk is intermediate form between the letter and the book, between the lexia and the docker verse. If the essay you're reading has a thesis, it concerns the need for intermediate form. Now, what does that mean? Well, think about a book. You've got words and sentences and chapters, and each of those have a certain formal consequence. The hypertext looks like a cloud of links. And if it's an informational hypertext, typically it may have a hierarchical unity. But what would it mean to have a form that would give you a certain way of reading, but would remain porous and interruptible, and would provide a new mode of reading. I'm going to go to a different link here. Here's a way of asking the question. What does thinking mean <laughs> if it's not providing focus, critical judgment, beginnings, middle, and end? Preventing the indefinite combinatorial and associative accumulation of words and images. Is an out of control hypertext just what thinking must avoid? A mass of fragments, many voices. For Plato, defining philosophy, 
it was crucial to get away from the crowd, limiting discourse to a few face-to-face -face encounters. Keeping down the number of speakers means that everything can be critically judged. But what is the control that is lost if it isn't the argumentative line? Must thinking be in control? What do we mean when we say, think about this? Then this little square that you see appearing over the text, this is the way that this edition of Story Space indicated links. This is before they did blue and underline. The advantage of this method is that links don't stand out. But when you do this, you make them aware, and you can click on them. Here there were two possible links to go. And I can follow one of them. In a hypertext, there can be so many levels that everything ends up on the same level. What does this do to philosophy? Or I can follow the other. Do we identify thinking as coherent and coherence with narrative and argumentative connection between befores and afters? Coherence, contrast, and the web are not limited to those. Can we widen our concept of coherence? Even if one accepts the claim that philosophy essentially needs arguments, these arguments are inscribed in a context they do not control. Can hypertext do, be, or examine that context? Yes. But what kind of flexibility does it offer? So what kind of new textual maneuvers could you do in hypertext? Would they be deconstructive? They could be, but they could be otherwise as well. Pardon me while I... What happens with this story space is you get windows proliferating all over the screen, and then you have to maneuver them around. Hypertext needs to discover ways to enact complex interactions that go beyond simple implications or topic and comment. The new writing might treat views and conceptual structures more like landscapes to be explored than positions to be defended or attacked. It might seek fluidity and reuse rather than foundations and definitive positions. It might provide paths that bring us to read a given lexia more than once which is really crucial. When you think of a hypertext as merely informational, you sort of, you get it. You don't have to come back to it. This is a quote from Carol and Gaia. The form of the text is rhythmic, looping on itself in patterns and layers that gradually accrete meaning, just as the passage of time and events do in one's life. Such forms and figures would acknowledge their own temporality and their own location in a multiple and generative spacing of form. There's a comment here, which I'm not going to read all. Stuart Moskow commenting on George Landau. Right. But I want to point out, Moskow is right that Landau's rules aim at a very ordered and clearly delineated text, which is not surprising, since Landau aims to produce what are mainly reference words. There are wilder ways of writing hypertext, some well illustrated in Moskow's own fiction. But Wolfram's objection is in danger of confusing the existence of the territory with the rigidity of the border. One of my contentions is that the simultaneous presence and porousness of forms within hypertext. We do not need to dwell in absolute security in order to be somewhere. This said, I think Wolfram is right when he writes about hypertext as involving, quote, an inexhaustible latency of other orders, an approach to structure as transitional. What does that do when you're dealing with a philosophy which tries to codify form? I keep emphasizing the need for new forms and figures in philosophy. This presumes hypertext links can be bridges forming relatively unified and porous structures. Now, let's back off from this for a minute. It's all very interesting to know what you could do differently in philosophy, but after all, that is one area. 
important as I may think it is. But we have to ask this question. Why should we care? Why are you reading this? Why should you read it? Why should we care whether argument and philosophy can be done in new ways in web writing? Because it's not just a professional question. It's the return of the worry about how we organize our knowledge, about our ways of talking and being with one another. It's another way of asking, what has become of reason in our postmodern world? It asks about the nature of our conversational and textual places. And it asks what forms or totality or non-totality they may have today. This is a question about the world of changing media, mediation and technology, and our changing selves. So you say, well, it's about philosophy. It's about reason. It's about what reason means today. Who we keep worrying that our knowledge is expanding, we can't keep up with it. That's one of Vannevar Bush's motivations for hypothetical. Does our knowledge have to add up to a whole system? What has become of reason in a world where it seems dominant, yet fragmented, overwhelming, but unfounded, where reason provides a key, but seems irrelevant sometimes to our big concerns? Well, here's the connection. Some critiques of modern society point out the lack of intermediate structures between the individual and the big bureaucratic state or the global economy and the oppression this entails. A hypertext similarly structure poor would be analogously oppressive. Intermediate figuration creates open space. If you face the global economy or the government yourself as an individual, you're much better off if you have a union, a society, a family, an ethnic group, whatever, which gives you a certain coherence. In our postmodern world, we are trying to create social and political forms that are not atomic individual units, nor totalizing structures. These would be forms that would be temporary and permeable, but providing space, and we're painfully learning to inhabit them without demanding fixity and closure. Well, that's exactly the problem in philosophy. You want to have temporary permeable forms, new ways of putting things together. So the philosophical problem is analogous to the social problem. It's analogous to a self problem. How do we arrange a self in a world which is both discontinuous, multiple, and yet has some firm intermediate forms which remain permeable, porous, and so on. These forms will take advantage of the nonlinear characteristics of the medium. We do not know what these forms will be, but they will be in the link as we are. Now, I've been arguing then that the question about philosophy and hypertext is really a larger question about the role of reason when things and break hierarchies break down. And part of that role is to create new modes of writing and reading that involve what I call intermediate forms. Well, you might be reading the hypertext and you have to pass over things. Mark Bernstein has done some interesting work along those lines. There may be varying degrees of hierarchical order imposed upon a space. A group of items could form a highly connected island with only a few links. There could be clusters of clusters of islands. Links can be one way or allow travel in both directions. Paths through the space can be linear, looping, branching. The hard question is not what abstract geometry patterns of connection these structures can assume in a hypertext, but what use they'll find, what forms of life they will enable. The printed page can be found as part of wildly divided, differing activities. We can imagine new hypertexts might help or alter activities we already perform, but it's harder to imagine what new forms of life hypertext might develop. I can't offer any magical guide to the possible uses and meanings of hypertext any more than I could offer a guide to the meanings and uses of conventional writing. But I do want to talk about hypertext in the limited context of philosophical activity. But what I'm saying is that is the context also in which we are trying to create ourselves and our society. If you go back to philosophy, you could say, look, 
What does philosophy do? What's the work that a text performs? Can it do argumentative work? What is thinking if not linear? <laughs> what is thinking if not linear? And part of the argument I would make is it is linear, but it's always more than linear. <laughs> and hypertext has the chance to model that, to give us ways of encrusting the line, of making the fluid surroundings of the linear discourse more, more obvious. Can the philosophical hypertext make claims? Just as there's no one conclusion, many different readings, many different paths, well, the question is, must a claim be the demand to a form of proposition? A text can make a claim on you, even if it doesn't argue for a particular proposition. It could claim your acknowledgement. It could claim that you acknowledge this is where we live. This is who you are. These are connected. There are more possibilities than you thought. While such claiming can be reported in propositions, there need be no propositions explicitly argued for it that the claim may be made on you. A claim can be demonstrated in ways that are not argument. Exploration can make claims on us. The horizon can call to us. The newly discovered mountain can demand our response. So too, a text can make a claim on you. Hypertext can make claims on you. New kinds of claims. That was my hope, that we could find new ways in philosophy to do that. Whether that was achieved or not, we can talk about in a discussion. But that was what this work was about. Trying to encourage people to read hypertext in new ways, find new ways of writing and performing text, and new ways of thinking that would enlarge our sense of reason and lead to a better sense of who we are in the world where hierarchies are being dismantled, which goes back to the original point, Nonlinear text, nonlinear lives, nonlinear reading, nonlinear selves doesn't mean totally fragmented. It means finding forms, creating new modes of being and reading. So that's now what these other pieces in the text do is provide a few examples of other forms that you could do in philosophy. They're interesting. They're, I think, a little creative. But what I'm really calling for is for people to create other new ways to do things. Whether the current tools and whether the current web allows that needs discussion. <laughs> Okay. I have a question. Um, why do you think the other philosophers were opposed to learning about or putting the material on hypertext? I think there are a couple of reasons. One is the tools were not very handy. Another is philosophy is extraordinarily conservative in its mode of reading and writing, especially in the English-speaking world. You tended to have a desire to produce prose articles relatively short and pointed. 
and the kind of digressive, multiple reading, looping back kinds of structures I was urging um, went against that and didn't find a receptive audience. It also has to do with institutional things, like how do we count things for tenure? So creative modes of writing were not always encouraged. And the people who did the most creative writing, like say Kierkegaard or Nietzsche, uh, are not academic. <laughs> right. I have a question. Uh -huh. uh, and this just sort of occurred to me, I, I haven't really prepared it, but um, propositional logic is linear in nature. One thing builds That's on right. another. Do we have a do we have or do we need a different kind of logic for hypertext philosophy? One where the tools don't require a linear progression? The answer is sort of yes and sort of no. You can get along with propositional logic, but you need more. At the very least, you need to be able to surround it. But I'm a Hegel scholar, among other things. And Hegel makes a very interesting point at one place when he knew some early 19th century attempts to do geometric and mathematical looking things for logic. Not the stuff that came later, which is more sophisticated, but some basic things. And he said, that's never going to work. Because if you're going to do geometry, you're going to end up with only very few kinds of relationships. Mm -hmm. Inclusion, exclusion, follow from linearly. But he said, our basic concepts don't link that way. They are including one another mutually. They're co-constituting one another. There's one level that subsumes other levels, and yet remains a distinct. So the effect of all that is that the linear logic doesn't keep up with the complexity of the, not just of our concepts, but the way in which our institutions and forms of life self-transform and so on. So he says some good things about that. Of course, then he tries to overly systematize it. Right. But his insight there, I think, is very accurate. And there are people who try to turn his stuff into elaborate formal logic, but that's the most, that's a mistake. So why don't you talk about the title, Socrates and the Lambert? Right. And that's the, that they haven't been discussed yet, and that might be... Okay. Socrates useful. is, after all, the preeminent ideal philosopher. Plato made him so by canonizing him. In fact, <laughs> we do know the historical Socrates. We have other testimony about his life. But it's clear that Plato's Socrates is special. The other people make Socrates not seem so interesting. And Plato's Socrates is not just a mouthpiece for Plato's views, but he, he's an image of the inquirer. The basic thing that Plato says Socrates is trying to do is to make you convert to this conversion. You may be wrong. Your basic values and your basic ideals may be mistaken. We ought to talk about that. And what, in, what that means is not shouting back and forth, talking heads, you know, on CNN or something <laughs> like that, but mutual conversation, Socrates says, where each of us is ready to be refuted, where we're jointly working towards the truth. And if we don't get there, and in most of the dialogues they don't, there's an ethic there. And that ethic is mutual respect, willingness to be wrong, and seeking the truth together. There's a certain erotic component to that. <laughs> but Socrates, as that figure, can dominate inquiry even when people reject all of Plato's views, that image of what inquiry is about. Now, think about the labyrinth. The labyrinth in Greek mythology is the maze which was created uh, in Gnosos to confine the Minotaur, uh, this beast which had been born of an unholy union. And the labyrinth was a labyrinth because once you got in, you couldn't get out, and then the beast could eat you. Right? And Theseus, the famous king of Athens, slew the Minotaur because he, he was a real bastard, but he, <laughs> he seduced, fell in love with, take your choice, since he abandoned her later. It wasn't exactly a love relation. 
<laughs> Pasiphae's daughter, Ariadne, who gave him string, the path through the labyrinth. So he, you put the string at the beginning, you find your way in, and then you come out by following the string. So the, the, the key to, to getting out of the labyrinth was to have a linear connection, yeah. even though it might twist. Now it's not clear if you put Socrates in the labyrinth of hypertext, there isn't any one string. But that doesn't mean that there may not be local forms and patterns that could be discovered. So I thought the image of Socrates in the labyrinth, there isn't any beast in the labyrinth, you're just lost. How can you create order, new kinds of order, in the labyrinth? So there's a question here from online, from Dark Poison, Dark Poison 64. What are the ethical aspects of having the hypertext language in relation to other schools of thought from other philosophers like, De like Descartes? Descartes is an extreme example of the kind of philosopher who says, we're going to have an argument that goes this way. Absolutely certain first principles, dun, chun, 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 <laughs> step by step by step. So it's a, he's a, what we would call a really extreme foundationalist. <laughs> and in actual fact, Descartes is more complicated practice, but that's his ideal. And hypertext, Descartes would say, is just confusing the matter. It's, it's eating away at that line. And so he wouldn't like it. <laughs> On the other hand, it's also true that Descartes, before he published his big works, circulated them among his friends and enemies, got their commentary on it. And when he published some of his works, he published the commentaries and his replies at the same time. So the line is there, but it's surrounded by a kind of informal discourse, which helps locate it and which helps tell you how to follow it. Now, he would say that's unnecessary, but the truth is he did it. <laughs> and he had to do it because you have to learn how to follow the line. And you have to figure out how the line attaches to your life. And that surrounding discourse is part of the philosophy. Otherwise, the line just hangs in empty space. And Aristotle is also a proponent of this idea of the strict line of argument. But when you look at Aristotle's actual works, mostly they're about this surrounding discourse. Mm -hmm. Kant makes a very important distinction between mathematics and philosophy. He says, mathematics starts with definition. You know how you mm -hmm. do geometry. Philosophy ends with definition. <laughs> right? That is, most of the philosophy is getting to the point where you could build the line. And that getting to the point is not itself a linear process. Right? It's a weaving process. Aristotle said, Plato used to always ask, are we on our way to the principles or on our way from them? <laughs> and philosophy is always on its way to the principles. And therefore, a linear arrangement is not sufficient. Any other questions? David? Yeah. So you talked in, um, earlier about um, how text can stake claims. Mm -hmm. how, how would you describe that well, phenomenon? The, the easy thing about an argument uh, Nisbet says the perfect philosophical argument would be this. You accept this principle, you accept this principle, and if you don't accept the conclusion, your head blows up. You know, that's what you would like. <laughs> An argument you know, so, so convincing that you were, if you refuse the conclusion, you die. You know, well, of course, that doesn't happen. But that's the dream. There's a real violence theme in Nindimity. Right? There's two kinds of metaphors you get in philosophy and argument. One is, I'll buy that. <laughs> I accept that conclusion, but I, I won't buy your conclusion, so I'm going to have to tinker with the argument. And the other is conquest. Mm -hmm. you know, I destroyed his argument. Mm -hmm. you know, I demolished his position. And that these violent images, very masculine, very warrior-like, mm -hmm. or very commercial, that's part of what we have to get away from. Right? Well, I'm going to focus on your question. Your question was about the line and what the text could do. Yeah, well, how, how it can claim, how text can make claims yeah. and then how hypertext can even yeah. more so. Right? Okay, so the, the argument claim would be 
if you accept A and B, you're going to have to accept C. You know the usual example. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. So Socrates is mortal. It's hard to deny that. That's what's called a deductive argument. The conclusion is already implicit in the premises. But then take a different kind of argument. The sun rose the last 4,000 days have I been alive. Therefore, the sun will rise tomorrow. It doesn't have the same necessity. Right? You can imagine situations where the sun wouldn't rise tomorrow. So that's a claim which has a different kind of foundation. And that's an inductive argument. And when you get to claims like that, it's not just like A, B equals C. It's like A and B are, mm, yeah, most likely. You know. So that's the way that claims can be made. And that introduces qualifications. And one of the things hypertext is good at is making explicit qualifications of showing how claims live within a context which is larger than the particular thing. Now, does that help? Well, it means that faced with the whole picture, you may be willing to accept the claim better. But it also means there's another kind of thing, which philosophy doesn't do very well. Actually, Kierkegaard is pretty good at this. Um, describing a way of life, and not saying, you must believe this, but saying, isn't that you? <laughs> you know, where what's, uh, asking, what's being asked for, the claim is not, do you believe the proposition X? It's, do you acknowledge that this is where you live, who you are, and so on? And then literature is very good at that. And hypertext can do that, but it hasn't done it much because it's mostly just information retrieval. But imagine a text which took you by all sorts of devious routes over a landscape and then said, is this your life? Is this where you live? Those are, that can be a mode of persuasion, and then you have to figure out how to uh, judge it, whether the persuasion is right. But that's a kind of claim. So Judy Malloy writes, Thank you, David. We have all become so accustomed to web hypertext that returning to your words points out that we need to continue to explore thinking with hypertext. Yeah. Do you want to respond to her? Now? I do. <coughs> the program I was showing you had various affordances which allowed you to create these looping structures where you would have to go several times through a set of sequence of lexias, reading them differently each time the way you would reread a poem or something like that. Web hypertext doesn't encourage that. Mm -hmm. right? I wrote a big web hypertext called Sprawling Places. It's got very complicated link structure of seven or 800 streams. And this is a book version of it, but the web version is similar, bigger actually, than the book. And Google Analytics, which is I've attached to it, shows that, that people don't read it the way I wrote it. They come in, they read one or two lexias, and they go away. Mm -hmm. Or they spend 10 minutes reading, but they don't go looping around or anything like that. It's just long, chunk, chunk, linear. So the habits of reading that I was trying to encourage haven't happened, partly because the tools available don't encourage it. And our method of, I mean, Google, right? Most of the people who come into that big hypertext because they some name I mentioned, or some picture that I took, is found on Google. They go in, they see it, and they, get, they leave. Mm -hmm. Average time of reading, 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. so. Well, it's very frustrating when you're trying to get someone to spend an hour, you know, looping around and so on. But then again, on the web, who of us do that? Uh, mm. <laughs> <laughs> Other okay. questions? I, you know, I think it would be interesting to also talk about because they're, they all know how to code. Yeah. And they're creating hypertextual, you know, uh, documents. A lot of them are, are information based, mm -hmm. right? And we're take, we, offer, we offer a course called Digital Storytelling, so they're learning how to do, mm -hmm. use Twine for storytelling. But what they haven't really seen is this kind of story space environment where ideas are nested within ideas which are nested in ideas. Mm -hmm. So if you jiggle your uh, mouse a little bit and bring up maybe that one of your um, beautiful 
images of how things are nested. So you click mm -hmm. on a link and then it opens up a box and everyone's a box opens a box. Mm -hmm. That is the, that right there. So if you can see that on this screen or over here, you can see that inside of there, stuff nested in with that. So do you want to talk a little bit about yeah. the kind of thinking structure that you had to use to make that mm -hmm. happen? Because that's different than linking text together. Yeah. Can we get the camera on the screen? Can we get the camera on the screen again? Story space had a feature that you could, I didn't use it, but there is a feature. You can block access to certain nodes until people have read other nodes. You can have a rule. The famous hypertext afternoon was sort of the first literary hypertext. You couldn't read it all straight because you had to, you had to have read X before you could get to Y. It wouldn't even be available to you until you'd done X, or maybe X and Y would let you give the machine to read. That control, that's why Story Space program was written, so that you could do that. Now, I didn't use that control, but, because it didn't seem philosophical, but, uh, but this idea of nesting things, and then I tried to work out these visual cues so that people would see certain things together. And uh, there are typically three or four layers of these things. And when I wrote the big web hypertext, I had a map of it, but I couldn't show it. There's no web way to do that. So I had to use a little outline. But this text, actually, you can read linearly by using the link. You can read it, as I was doing, partly by using the map. So that it's very flexible. And those tools tend to see go down layers. And that's just a convenience. I mean, you can take you could put it up this way. So we calculated yesterday there's 195 boxes in that. It looks like bricks, right? Can you see that? It looks like bricks. But each one of those little brick is a node, and one of those nodes has more nodes of text Inside. in it. So you, so the, if you think about it, the the metaphor is very. It's like the nesting doll. Mm -hmm. right? Think about it this way: space, a book has one line, it's a line. You can jump around on the line, random access. You know, check the footnote, go back, put your thumb in the thing, read the conclusion, so you were curious how the mystery was going to come out. You know, go back to the beginning because you really like that. What, read the sexy scene in the middle. You can do that. It's, it's non-linear. But the book has this order. Now, you in effect are moving in a second dimension on this line. But what if there were more dimensions? And so there were different things you could do with the text. There were different spaces in which you could move, some of which you were creating as you created new nodes. Because the idea would be that the hypertext was added to you by the reader. And there have been attempts to do that. And the problem they turned out to have is the same problem you have with comments on blogs. Mm -hmm. yeah. The attack of the mutant link, the troll. <laughs> you, know. you want to make something that will be a cooperative project, and it gets denuded because all sorts of crap gets added to it. And if you try to stop that and don't allow it, then you're back to not doing it. So that's a problem that we've never been able to solve. And there were interesting attempts, thing called Hypertext Hotel, <laughs> which was a, a, basically you could write a story and add it to other stories, a room in the hotel. And it was very interesting in the beginning. And it got flabbier and flabbier and less and less interesting because people just kept adding all sorts of repetitive junk, which is discouraging to the people who were trying to make it better. I mean, the people had good intentions when they added it, but they weren't putting in the effort to do more than say, oh, let's have another adultery story. Yeah. Yeah. So the other thing I think is interesting is the, the way you structured the text. So you have the main text, Socrates and the Lambert, but you have four additional texts mm -hmm. that accompany it. Habermas Pyramid, mm -hmm. Earth Orbit, Cleavings, and Aristotle, Aristotle's Argument. Mm -hmm. So maybe if you can talk about how those pertain to the main text mm -hmm. and their structural differences, because mm -hmm. that's really cool. And then the last one, which never made it into the final yeah. version, which is um, the one called Cage Text. Yeah. So I'd like to get that on video. Okay. <laughs> I think it's really important. 
what I did with these was to show, I mean, if you look at them, they're, they're rather relatively brief. Uh, I'll try to start it up on up. Cleavings relates text in a funny way. And, yeah. And, You have three, four different kinds of ways in which you can write text, different patterns of cutting up the text, different ways of doing it. So it's a, an experiment in different modes of arrangement. Aristotle's argument takes an argument from Aristotle and spells it out in an interesting way using links. The Habermas pyramid takes an argument, you, you state the argument very briefly, and you click on one sentence and you get an expansion of that sentence again and again. So it's, it's a pyramid that gets wider because it's more detailed. Earth orbit. Earth orbit is the oddest of these four. <laughs> it's the orbit refers to circles. So there's a text and little epicycle text shoes off of it at various points, if you see the picture here. Uh, it's hard to do this on a screen because it's, it's very large. <laughs> but you can see that there's the circular the path, and in each of these blue nodes, there's stuff around it, which makes for a discussion. So it's, again, a, a, just an interesting attempt to, to organize things in a different fashion. The cage text was the most fun. <laughs> I said, now, the deconstructed people, one of the things that Derrida has been trying to make out is to say, look, meaning is uncontrollable. When you say, this is the meaning of the text, I can show you, he will say, that other meanings are creeping in that the text is kind of undermining its own claim to absoluteness. And he does very elaborate ways of doing it. Or he'll take two texts and put them in parallel columns. This is not hypertext length, so just visually on the page. And the contingent way you read them, not specific links, but just the way your eye does it, will create meanings and connections. So I said, all right. I went to my library, and I picked I forget how many books at random. Actually, what I did is I used the secrets of digits in pi. <laughs> and I said, OK, four. So I'll go to the fourth shelf. Five, I'll count over five books. That's one. I'll go to the eighth shelf and count over three, you know, and so on. So then I have 10 or 20 books. And in each of those, I randomly chose some pages. All right. So now I have paragraphs that have no source relationship to one another, except in the kind of things I'm interested in. Uh, some philosophy, some art, some how to do it books and whatnot. And then I put them on the screen, and I may pass through them, again, using pi. So the connections are completely random. The texts are completely random. And there are also a few paths that are not random. Uh, and then I said, look, even with all of that total randomness. As you read it, you're going to get meaning. You're going to get connections. You're going to find them. You're going to create them. So this says something about the fertility of text and the inability of us to block it and make impose one set of meanings. Because here, these are absolutely contingent connections. And yet, we find meaning in them because we can't not find meaning. Right? And that's meant to prove a point, a Derridian point, that language always exceeds any attempt to completely systematize it. But it's also meant to say hypertext can provide a collision of perhaps unrelated things, which will still give us something worthwhile. Doesn't it also speak to how human beings want to make meaning of things? Mm. It's just have to human, make meaning. It's, we have to. It's just we're driven to it. Mm. We can't exist. I mean, it's almost like this existential problem we have with nothingness. Mm. We cannot have 
chaos. Mm -hmm. You cannot have nothingness. We have to make order. That's just hum that's part of being human. Well, uh, people who didn't do that, organisms who didn't do that, wouldn't be alive. That's right. <laughs> it's a very uh, evolutionarily smart thing <laughs> to find meaning. But, but I mean, see, the hypertext has these possibilities. But if you look at the web, massive uses of hypertext, it's mostly looking up information. It doesn't do any of these things, unless by accident. And so much more could be done. I also want to get on record before we end um, your relationship with Eastgate Systems, Inc. Mm -hmm. Because what we're doing in this lab in the first round is focusing on pre-web mm -hmm. hypertext. So everything you're experiencing in the next thing this year are things that are not on the web because they, they weren't, because there was no web to put them on. But, but artists are trying to create stories and essays and poems that were linked together in hypertextual in nature, and we had to do it with no HTML. We had to do it without the web. Mm -hmm. So his work is sitting on a system called StoryStake, a platform called StoryStake. Others used HyperCard. Others used, Judy Malloy used Narrabase. Mm -hmm. George Landau started off with Intermedia. Mm -hmm. And they produced these themselves so that Judy especially created her own software to do this. Mm -hmm. So you met Mark Bernstein through George Landau. George Landau. And then, so talk about right. the Eastgate Well, time. Uh, as I mentioned, it was in Eugene, Oregon, on the first time we were traveling in the uh, Northwest in 1992. We moved here in 2006, but we didn't know that at the time. Um, and I was in the bookstore, and I was reading this article, and I said, oh, I got interested in what about the narrative line, what about the argumentative line? So I contacted Landau, and he said, you want to get a hold of this program, Story Space, we've just heard about it. Talk to Mark Bernstein. So I talked to Mark Bernstein, and I paid quite a bit of money to get the program and got some help with how to run it. And eventually, he published the article, the, the, the piece. Now, that's really good, and it sold and got interesting responses from the hypertext community. The problem is, it's in this format, which is not available, except by buying it from him. And it doesn't run on modern computers. Finally, he did update Story Space. You can now buy a copy of Story Space mm -hmm. for a regular Mac or I don't think he has Windows yet. I think he does, and I think the Mac, it ends with, um, I don't think it's for High Sierra. I uh, think it, it ends with the more current, yeah. yeah. And I could be wrong, but I think. So you can, using or using his program Tinderbox, which is a, a descendant of Story Space, you can read these things. It isn't the same experience, because the affordances of the program are different. But at least it's available. But he controls very tightly these things. So you can't, like I could create this sprawling place with hypertext because I did it myself by hand. I used this program Tinderbox to do it, but then I exported it to HTML. So it's on the web. You can't do that with these things because the patterns here don't come across well on the web. I mean, you could do it if you very painstakingly put up the map and created hand links mm -hmm. for each little above, the little X and everything. I mean, it, it would take a tremendous amount of effort. And even then, it, it wouldn't have the same effect. So that was one reason it never got into the professional philosophy world, because the professional philosophy world wasn't interested in Whereas the hypertext world was already there. How many copies did you sell? Hmm, 1,200, uh, 1,500, I don't know. That's good. That's yeah. really good. I know I bought a copy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I write a book, it'll sell typically three or 4,000 copies. Yeah. So there should be some by class here. Do you guys have any, when you're making, how many of you making twine for your final project? This is very twine-ish. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So you might notice some similarities in this in twine, but do you want to ask any questions about things? And especially we're, we're, we're talking about ethics in our class. Mm -hmm. So anything about ethics that might be interesting, digital technology? Mm -hmm. And these are some of my smart students right here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, the ethics of publication. 
are complex. I mean, there's the whole copyright issue, and mm -hmm. you're, you're familiar with that. But there's also the issue of finding a way to get attention. You know, who is going to, you know, if you think about the self-publication world these days, it used to be there were guaranteed gatekeepers, and if you could get their attention, you know, not for Random House or the University of <coughs> Chicago Press, they would advertise and they would get people's attention. That is decreasing for various economic and cultural reasons. So then you're left alone, you've produced this thing, and there's a torrent going by of other things. And it's the same as if you're trying to get people to listen to your record, mm -hmm. you know, your music. How do you get above, get enough of other people will, will even know that it's there? And the social media and so on. And there's ethical issues there, because you could do things that are unfair. You could falsely advertise. You could you know, promise more than you can deliver and all that. Uh, <laughs> uh, you could bribe Facebook or Google to spread it around in various ways. By bots. Yeah. There's a... Somebody wrote a cartoon about criticizing Facebook. And... He showed that Facebook had sent him a message, if you'd like this to be more famous, pay us so much and we'll boost it. Right. Yeah. It's so real. It's real. Yeah. And the thing was, what they were boosting was, and then he, and he said, LOL. Yeah. <laughs> but, so the economics is difficult. A point that I was making to someone here the other day was, if you go back to 17th or 18th century in philosophy, none of the people were academics, the famous philosophers. Descartes had some private money. For those who were around, Leibniz were living. Leibniz was a librarian and a diplomat. Locke worked for the patent, for the trade office. Hume had government positions and so on. These were all people who privately self-published. Universities did not control academic publication in those days. And most of their work was done by letter, mm -hmm. what would be the local currently equivalent of blogs, you know, sending letters to their friends and back and forth. We need to recreate that economy, mm -hmm. where it's not just me alone in the, in the stream saying, look, look, I'm holding up a sign, this is my thing. But we create a community by blogging, by letters, by social media, not just you know, to the world, but you get a group. And that group gives you a place and gives you a home, and then that group can together work to try and make it visible elsewhere. But we don't know how to do that yet. I'm getting there, I hope. <laughs> yeah, but the, the tool makers don't want to make it easy for us. No, they don't. Yeah. I think we're about out of time. Unless somebody else has another question. Thank you, David, for oh. this. And if you're interested, Dave brought a lot of things to the lab that he's donating. So um, if you want to come anytime and see what he brought us, you're welcome to come and look at the wonderful treasure trove of materials. Um, so thank you. Including